Give us any chance, we'll take it. Read us any rule, we'll break it. We're gonna make our dreams come true. Join it our way. Welcome to Nat podcast by eight seasons in a row. I'm Lisa Fernandes and... Chances are that I'm Christopher J. Wardner. Hello. 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 <laughs> and welcome to Death Row. <laughs> You're <sighs> sitting on it. We've watched it and our brains are somehow still intact. Uh, this is both parts. Uh, I guess we are going to put them together in a single podcast, even though on DVD is two separate episodes and syndication is two separate episodes. It's um, arranged differently there, but here we are doing it. One single fell swoop. Uh, both parts were directed by Tom Trevich. Uh, part one was written by Gene Bronstein and Rob Perlow. Part two was written by Nick LaRose. Chris probably has some facts coming up about them. I do. We have an interesting piece of trivia about Tom today, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. Ah. And here's what both episodes are about. While trying to swindle the bank out of a set of free dinnerware after Carmine accidentally shatters hers, Alone and Laverne makes the acquaintanceship of Sheba and Aaron, two hippie revolutionaries looking to case the joint. After they worm their way into Laverne's life, Laverne finds herself caught up in the activities of Ralph, radical action for love, peace, and happiness. Before she knows that she's unwillingly hosting meetings for the organization and carrying dynamite to their attempt at robbing the bank. Laverne Sheba and the rest of the gang are arrested, and Laverne Sheba's flipped choices of nicknames result in them being mistaken for hardened criminals who are nearly immediately set for execution on death row. Laverne and Sheba anxiously settle in, dream of the future, bastardize the show's opening credit theme, and sing a random gospel number. Hope comes in the form of Lenny and Squiggy, who are there to perform conjugal visit duties as well as sell contraband to the prisoners. Even though Squiggy's afraid Frank will hurt him for telling him the news, Lenny takes a note from Laverne, but both become reluctant to actually give it to Frank or Carmine. Is Laverne a dead duck, or will the place she can sit down be her couch? Meanwhile, Carmine is deeply disenchanted with his life as a singing telegram, and Lenny and Squiggy eat Laverne out of house and home. What did you think of this one, Chris? <sighs> I feel like, you know, uh, we were asked the question of um, in our uh, discord by our, our friends of the show yes, uh, as to what our plans were to make our way through monastery. And my plan for that is to uh, double bill Santanico Pandemonium and Alucarda or Convent of the Holy Beast as a follow up. In this case, I think the big birdhouse and the... Uh, and Chained Heat are going to be very necessary, with probably Female Prisoner 701 Scorpion as well, as a chaser. Uh, I've seen both of those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already ahead of you. I actually haven't, you know, I actually haven't seen the Female Prisoner 701 films. I've had a copy of the first yeah. one for like 10 years, and I've never watched it. So, reviewing the second time around, I didn't hate the first part as much as I did the yeah. first time. The second yeah. part is still awful. Yeah. Yeah. The second part's the big problem here. Yeah. The like the first part is rough and it, it, it doesn't just flanderize Laverne. It just makes her so goddamn stupid. I mean, yeah, it makes yeah, her, this, this. It, it's, it's infuriating. Look, okay. Can I read here? Laverne is so dumb here. She cannot freaking kill a fly successfully. <laughs> they have made her so stupid. She cannot kill a fly. She used to be street savvy, intelligent, able to sneak out of the apartment without surely finding her, uh, able to sneak a guy into her room without being caught. Here she is so stupid she tries to iron a tomato onto her blouse because it's the same color. <laughs> they make her... So incredibly dumb, and that is the only real problem we have with part one, except for the stupidity of the police officers and cops thinking they can get away with executing two completely innocent women in the, spa in the place of two hardened criminals who they probably don't even resemble and who probably don't have matching fingerprints. Yeah, that, that's the thing that was the weirdest thing, that they ship them off for execution for prison transport without fingerprinting them. Not to mention, yeah. someone who is that level of dangerous criminal they are not going to just be filed on through. Those are folks going in lockup. Those are folks that are getting yeah. escorted with multiple layers of handcuffs into a cell 
and essentially put in solitary and not being allowed to talk to anybody because, you know, there's all these tons of reasons, even in the 60s, that they would have known not known better than to do that. The freaking 60s around this era is when Manson happened. Manson. Two years from Manson happening. And uh, not to mention uh, the Weatherman Underground was active at this yeah. point as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. We had hardened criminals. Yeah. Starkweather already happened. All this shit already happened. Oh, yeah. And it's just, it's so illogical. And you can say, oh, it's Silver and Chili. Silver and Chili, it's silly. We can just pretend this is okay. The show had a base level of logic. They didn't try to fry Liver from stealing something from, freak, from the freaking department store back in season two. Yeah. Yeah, my, my mother yeah. actually pointed that out because uh, my mother had opinions about this one. And oh, your mom, your poor mom. She like she even like I remember discussing the ideas of like how to rewrite the end, the second half of the or actually really how to rewrite the second episode, the second half part of this two parter. And she just kept yeah. immediately going. Just I want something else like, yes, just something even close to that is fine because it's better yeah. because what yeah. she what she especially disliked about it was that they were able to do guilty until proven not innocent and it was fine and they figured out the scope of it and here it just goes so dark so extreme yeah. Yeah. and it's so and to, to to be able to pull it off is so stupid yeah that it's uh you know that that it does it and it ends up making a joke of all the of, it makes a joke of the wrong things and she really, yeah, yeah. And, and, we'll, and we'll get to the Lenny and Squeaky thing, but she really yeah. hated yeah. the Lenny and Squeaky thing. The whole thing plays like a fever dream. Every part of it feels like the actors, the directors and the writers are high. That's bad. <laughs> Even right in the beginning where Carmine's in his stupid corn costume and he's going, is that me? <laughs> Looking in a mirror. He sounds lobotomized. That is a lobotomized action. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he just took a huge hit off of a joint. That makes no sense when it comes to human behavior. Just, oh, God. It's yeah, my, my, my mother also did no, no, uh, notice as soon as he walked into the room. Oh, how corny. <laughs> mother knows Laverne's fucking blouse in my eyes. That fucking Freddy Krueger shirt. And it comes back in the next episode, too. Oh, it's so ugly. Uh it's so green and it's not attractive at all. It's like Freddy Krueger uh, blew a snot rocket under her boobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, this episode is oh, painful and ridiculous. Part one is indeed a little bit better. A lot of that is because of Lorraine Newman, who really commits to yet another one of her Valley Girl characters. Guy. She, yeah, which she did a lot on SNL. And here she is being a Valley Girl here, and she's doing a pretty good job of it. She's like one of only three good things in this episode. That's yep. it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do but love I like, that. I do love her yeah. name is Sil uh, Sylvia Berman, and her dad's name is yeah. uh, is uh, Herman Berman. Herman Berman. His little yeah, Sylvia's in the slammer. Yeah, her little Sylvia's in the slammer. That's so cute. She is, like I said, one of three things that is actually good about this episode. We'll get to the other two as we get to them. But Lord, 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 Lord. <laughs> oh, God, this episode's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> it's nightmare. This is, this is one of the episodes I was warning you about. Yeah. Uh, about being terrible before we got here. Yeah. It, this it's, is the point. Yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's, it's pretty bad. No, yeah. yeah. No, I, I thank you for yeah. the warning. Yeah. This is the point where the show hits a level we decide to stop obeying reality. And we start getting stuff like uh, Olympic ghosts in the apartments. And Carmine having a dance craze. And whatever the hell is going to happen to Monster Story. And Laverne being stalked by an evil acrobat. And all this kind of stuff. Oh, and the uh, and don't forget the defector. Oh, yeah. I actually like that one. That's actually a good episode. That, that's only saved because David and uh, Penny have insane chemistry. And can pull it off and make, make you care that Squiggy might die here. So, unlike this episode where Lenny and Squirt, you don't even give a shit if Laverne's going to die. Yep. <laughs> what yeah. a lovely tribute to seasons and seasons of growth and friendship and caring. And the fact that they, you know, almost, you know, they threw themselves on the line to protect her from a rapist. But here it's like, oh, fuck it if she dies, hey. At least I've got her chicken. <laughs> At least Lenny's crying. 
Lenny's almost behaving in character, but not quite. But uh, it's a nightmare. We'll get to the nightmare. Okay, we're gonna go back. To yeah, the let's let's. Yeah, I was about to the end. Looking at my notes at the beginning. Okay, so <laughs> so basically, we have Carmine with the singing telegrams. He has got to get out. Got to find a better job. My my actually my note is God, dude, get a real job. Which <laughs> which which by the way, for me to say that is saying something. Because <laughs> oh, vicious. Uh, vicious. Yeah, I was attacked by a flock of crows. Don't laugh. Come on, don't do that. No, never did look good in corn. Now he decides it's degrading. Now, after everything he's already been through, it's ridiculous. Yeah, look on the bright side. You're still singing and traveling and meeting people. Laverne, I'm going to Oxnard to sing in a hen house. Still not as humiliating as half the stuff he did, did in Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Uh, I literally wrote down sweet Jesus at this point. Literally. <laughs> I, I would have written that down at the don't cry, you're going to get your niblets wet. Also, also somewhere around when they start they burst into a gospel number when Laverne's about to get fried. Um, we're getting there. We're getting there. We'll get there. Okay. Rhonda in disguise as pseudo sheriff as after Carmine yeah. has broken her, her uh, ceramics that now yeah. she's going to get a, a bunch of dinnerware from the yep. bank by starting a new account. Yep. yep. My note is that the dress and run are the second best thing about this episode. And the two of them together. I, I love the line. I'm with you all the way. And my note is I bet she is. Oh, The fact that she's done this so often, this poor bank teller that she's familiar is sad. It's like literally sad. Laver and they've made Laverne so stupid that she actually thinks she's going to keep getting away with this over and over again. Yeah. And it's a schemer move. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the kind of move the boys would make. Yeah. To be real. Oh, yeah. The boys would do this and think they wouldn't be recognizable and they go over in disguises. Not Laverne. She's not that dumb. They have made her a schemer like the boys and doesn't fit. Um... My all cap note. Wait, you're trying to just swindle them all dressed as corn? <laughs> yes. Aren't you Mrs. Cobb? Didn't you come oh, here with a guy God. dressed up as corn? Yeah. Uh. I want you to notice that she could just go to the market, buy some fiesta wear, but with the groceries, and it would be cheaper than doing this over and over again. It's true. It's true. Also, she has 40 bucks in the bank and she can't afford dishes, huh? Huh? Yeah. Huh? In 1967, $40 in yeah, the bank. Yeah, 1967, yeah. Yeah, in 1967, she could definitely buy cheap plates uh, at a department store for under 40 bucks in 1967. So. Not to mention, Rhonda loves doing hand-me-downs. Wouldn't Rhonda just yeah. spot her a couple of, until she gets some replacements? Exactly. Exactly. Freaking exactly. Laverne is insanely entitled. Let's be real. She's being insanely entitled to this situation. Well, at least we have Timothy Snack as the bank teller, though, that she interacts hey! with. Hey! Hey, Dick Dietrich! Notch Johnson! <laughs> I, I mean, it is amazing that he ended up writing, starring in a bunch of episodes and just creating Nightstand, creating that show. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he even most recently wrote a script for Freeform's uh, show uh, Sprung in 2022, oh, by the way. That's cool. That's very cool. But yeah, Timothy Stack. So for folks that might be wondering, why is that voice familiar? Uh, that's Lampy from The Brave Little Toaster. Oh. Who, who, oh, who by I love that that's how you recognize him. I recognize him from all those live action stuff like Son of the Beach. Which, uh... Well, see, I I never saw any of those. I didn't see much of the I didn't yeah. I don't think any of I, I maybe watched an episode of Starman, but not the one that he was in. I've never seen oh. any Remington Steel. I've never seen Punky Brewster. I've never seen Night Court. Oh. I have not watched oh. all of Back to School. <laughs> I've watched most of it, but not all of it. Eh. Um, And you know what? I tried. I didn't get into My Name is Earl. I tried. But I just couldn't oh, get into it. I love My Name is Earl. I love that show. Uh, he, I love that, and I love Raising Hope. So, uh, by the way, he also wrote on the Cindy Williams comedy special in 1994. So that's another. Oh, there you go. That's interesting. So he must have been friends way back, going way back with them. That's interesting. So we're talking about how stupid Laverne is. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> this. The, the I will say the bright side of ironing a tomato to your blouse. You have one for when you forget one on your sandwich. <sighs> This is one of those moments that is, like I said before, is agonizing to me because it makes Levert so dumb, so incredibly dumb, where she thinks, oh, I'll just keep my tomato on. Oh, who does that? <laughs> who the heck does that? Nobody does that. Most of their actions used to be based, like I said, in reality. You take something real that could happen to you and you stretch it. You stretch it until it's outlandish. And you always keep it grounded in the blue-collar life. And that was the success 
of the show, it gave people a sense that maybe these kinds of things could happen to me if I just had the right friends right. or the right circumstances. Uh, here, we're just out in Cloud Cuckoo Land. And uh, like I just a dip off of the freaking diving board. I will say Ralph is a funny acronym. Oh, it's an amazing acronym, especially because it's it's very vomity. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I do love uh, also um, the fact that Rhonda immediately holds uh, Laverne's hand as they leave the bank uh, partially unsuccessful. And Laverne suddenly goes, don't hold my hand when I'm not wearing my hat. Uh, <laughs> which so ridiculous. It's absolutely so ridiculous. I love it. Anyway, though, yes. Q, Ralph yeah. and the hippie scum. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's like, no, it's an organization. Radical action for love, peace, and happiness. I was just wondering if you had any spare change. Spare change? There ain't no such thing. Oh, man. Lorraine Newman, again, is the only thing holding up this episode. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, both parts is only... Though, yeah. we are going to see the guy who played... The guy who played um, the, the Aaron. Aaron, again. yeah. Yes. Yep. We are going to see the guy who played Aaron again. Deeper into the season, when we try to get the Carmine spinoff off the ground. Yep. Guess that's happening. And <laughs> he's a very good actor. He tried. He's, yes. He was trying really hard. And he has a natural swagger here that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah you could see uh, he was, because uh, he was on Good Times. Uh, yeah. Played the role of Keith Anderson. And he'd been yes. a regular for like a few episodes of Laugh In and playing the, he played most comedic but stereotypical roles in uh, Cheech and Chong movies, often as yes. like, you know, like a pimp or a hustler or something. Yeah. Sadly, uh, his last major role was in the new Mike Hammer in 84, 85. And when Stacey Keach had his conviction, uh, he quit the show before, you know, because he realized it was going to get canceled. He was like, yeah, th yeah. that's not going to happen. Uh, and they left the business after that. So. Aww. I'm glad we're gonna to get to see him for one more episode of this at least to be able to talk about him. But, Me too. but he's yeah. a cool dude. I really like, especially in the last episode of the season, where he gets to craft a whole character. It's really good. I mean, he has he has great chemistry with Eddie Mecca. Yeah. Uh, he need, they do try. They tr do try, and I, he does a good job. But man, God, this whole episode requires Laverne to be so dumb. I, I mean, so I, I have to give her some sympathy, though. Laverne is being invaded by Portland canvassers with all the guilting <laughs> about the world's problems. That blouse can feed a family of 16. Oh, God. Oh, How dumb does uh, Sheba have to be to think that a quarter will buy a hospital? Oh, God. Okay, here's the ultimate contest. Who is dumber here, Laverne or Sheba? Sheba has less brain cells, but Laverne is acting against her own self-interest. Yeah, so... It's the ultimate contest of crap. Yeah. <laughs> it's like who's worse? Like everybody's terrible. Yeah. Um it's it's yeah. it's kinda it's kinda like trying to um uh throw Jeff Bezos and Bobby Kotick into a death match, like oh who's God. the worst person? Who who oh who are you rooting God. for least? Who do you hope falls into the biggest volcano? This guy or that guy? <laughs> <laughs> um I hope they both burn. Anyway. <laughs> uh by the way, uh did you notice the fact she used the old Pepsi bottle for the um, the distilled water yes. for the for the iron? Yeah, that was cute. Yeah, that's a nice reference. Nice callback. I don't remember if Pepsi was actually sponsoring them still at this point, but oh. yeah, real good. Um, okay, so this is the ver my exact notes because this is where the part where she tries to kill a fly happens. This is just Laverne being incredibly stupid, isn't it? So stupid she can't even kill a fly. Help me. Yeah, I I <laughs> think you, I think you're right. It's. I felt like this was a really strange predecessor to, and I, I don't know how they were inspired for, to do Breaking Bad season three episode ten for this. <laughs> oh dear God! And Laverne immediately becomes attracted by a hot guy who's going to make out with her, so she doesn't notice the beret and the fatigues and the revolutionary talk. And it's all like, of them uh, essentially looking, well, I mean, obviously it's 10 years before their time, but it essentially, because yeah. when I saw the picture, you know, I, I was, was having, I wasn't even intending to see the photo, but I was, I was passing through season eight to do, um, I needed to do notes for some, some reason. And I saw the picture of her in the bank and I was like, holy shit, she looks like Patty Hearst. And yep. that, yep. and again, like that's, it's a little past nine because, because the, the Patty Hearst yeah. kidnapping was in 72, I think. Yes, yes. I'm 9% sure this was. I did at least appreciate that one of the ways that many of these organizations have a tendency of getting people in is through sex. They get them, they find the yep. weakness 
to make them pliable in these situations. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it was a Noah. He he does a smooch, and then yeah, and then Manny and Mo and Joe and Romulus. The yeah, the bell bot. The oh god, yeah. The, the the whole fatigues and everything. It it has to be pretty dumb. And the fact that you know yeah. clearly they had the firearms with them in the van, and she didn't notice was um pretty pathetic. Yeah, God, it's like, and they don't. Yeah, you, you don't even bother to look in the backpack. You, you just pick up the backpack and go. You just go. Oh, this is awful heavy. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like, Jesus Christ. Oh my God. My note is: Yes, Laverne, make out with the strange man. That's a great idea. <laughs> I will say Penny's Brando impression is funny. It is like, funny. That's real good. She funny. really got married, huh, guys? Uh. Oh, God. And then my next note is tread water faster. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I warned you. <laughs> she, like... she, had been, she had been referring to him as one of the great political thinkers of the time is, um, Maybe. yeah. <laughs> the, the, I will say, okay, I, before we continue, you know, razzing on the episode, I will say my mother laughed up a storm about the, uh, the ironing in the hair and then the, the, oh, that yeah. incense you're burning. It's really good. Yeah. It's all oh. natural. Oh my God. Uh, By the way, I love that your Sylvia impression makes her sound like Janice, which yeah, they could be sisters. <laughs> yeah. She, th yeah. I mean, that, that was what I was going to mention Janice as that's the person that, yeah. that, yeah. uh, Shiva slash Sylvia reminds me of, um, yeah. The Eleanor Roosevelt uh, bit I felt was pretty stupid. That Took that me right one. back to the White House, like oh, so yeah, bad. that one hurts. This part is just them treading water to try to stop us from getting to the bank fast enough, and it drives me nuts. My note is this is the kind of thing Shirley would do. Shirley would be naive enough. She wouldn't even be. She actually she would be smarter than this. She would actually get wrapped up in what Ralph was selling. Oh yeah. She would. She wouldn't realize it was going into that type of extreme because that's because she yeah. wants to believe in the best yeah. in people. That's that would be yeah. her line draw, you know, and that would be yeah, where yeah, Aaron would yeah. be very carefully letting her know enough. That would be, yeah. you know, because Aaron really is just a criminal like this is not a yeah. political thinker. It's basically he is a gang lord that some members of his crew know what's going on and some don't. And yeah, yeah it, it doesn't make any any sense anyway. But yeah, yeah. It's fucking stupid. Anyway, yeah, some, are, some of them are naive, some of them are not. Right, exactly. Because like yeah. Sylvia, you know, uh, Sheba is ignorant, but there are clearly members yes. of his group that like, you can see their body language that they're people that like did time with him probably yeah. in Vermont. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he, and he was just recruiting anybody who would come in and do the thing, basically. Yeah. Um, um, my note is Sheba is the brains here, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh did you at least enjoy the pen gag? Yeah, the pen gag was funny. The pen gag was all right. Yeah, it's funny. It was funny enough. And then Carmine showing up in the uniform. Yeah, my note was Eddie looks like a stripper done up as a cop. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. He, he looks like I, amazingly Carmine does not become a stripper for the end of the show. That feels like an occupation he would take on. Oh, certainly. God, yes. <laughs> They should be doing that in the late 60s. I heard one of you bachelorettes has been very naughty. Anyway. I'm imagining him, oh. yeah, just walking up and down yeah. saying that and uh, and Shirley then going, why couldn't it have been dated when he was doing that instead? <laughs> yes, yeah. Ripping open his shirt. <laughs> so, uh, and then adulterous cops. The right. Adulterous cops. Oh, yeah. Why? Yeah. You get your highest rating, and if you you know you don't like this, we won't tell tell your wife about the uh, the meter maid you're dating. Yeah, uh, at least Carmine is smart enough to say they don't look a little shady to you. I mean, admittedly, they are wearing yeah. shades, so that is a yeah, good point. They try to build off of you know anything that they can get going here, which is you know even a little bit of tight chemistry between Laverne and Sheba. Because hey, they're just like desperate to latch on to anything that will work, mm -hmm. and nothing is working. The donut line, why, why? <sighs> Somebody's gonna wear the dynamite, and it ain't gonna be Johnny Mathis. It's the okay line. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and then we yep. get to the actual bank job. Then the uh, yep. Too dumb. My note is it's too dumb for this to work. She's so dumb. Uh, Vermont, <laughs> five to ten yeah. years. Oh yeah. Uh. Vermont, uh, uh, I was in Vermont. Yeah, really? For how long? Eh, five to ten years. And uh, my note to that is, Laverne, you watch cop shows. You are not this dumb. Yeah. My literal note is in all caps. Why is she so stupid? Right. 
It's literally in my note, and it hurts so much to even write that down. And by the way, you will be happy to know that my next note is Laverne de Fazio joins the Sibianese Liberation Army. <laughs> <laughs> literally in my note. And everybody you, everybody we know notes that, or has noted that, that it looks like Laverne is joining their army. Because, you know, even I think even uh, Joe from uh, Happy Days Podcast noted that. Yeah, it's then a... why are you pumping your arms, you moron? Seriously. <sighs> Oh, God. And then we have anachronistic firearms, which as a uh, action movie nerd, I have to mention that uh, despite the fact the IMI Uzi that is used here uh, was around for a while uh, from like it was uh, throughout the 60s, it was very rare to see them in the United States. The Ingram Mac 10, though, that I believe uh, Ben Powers as Aaron is using, that did not come around until 1970. And I believe it was actually practically premiered in a film. That's why... Uh, that's why I mention it, um, because it was hey. in, um, yep, uh, McHugh, the the John Wayne picture. Hey. That was like a big premiere for it in film. Anyway, yeah, hey. that that was bothersome. I did like the little Walther uh, that they gave Lorraine, though. I was, thought that was cute. Anyway, so then we get to the dynamite, the hostage situation, and La Laverne with the ba bank teller and free the people. And it's like, why not free me now? And the bank manager and the manager. He's so impressed. <laughs> the manager also, I... I if he's FDIC insured, then this is the dumbest fucking thing he could do. That's why banks are supposed to roll over for bank robbers is they're insured. If you yeah, call a bluff, you're going to get somebody that. killed and then you're going to get sued. Yeah. So the, we have entered a point in this story where logic no longer exists. So. Yeah. And the, the bank manager, for that matter, by the way, was um, that was Gary Goodrow. I actually want to point out, uh, he was an alum of the committee, an improv heavy comedy group in the late 60s that also featured Larry Hankin and Carl Gottlieb. Eh, that's cool. Yeah. That's really neat. He, of course, obviously was in Linda Lovelace for president, which, get used to that, that's going to come a lot uh, uh, in this season as well. I but, feel like everybody was in that movie. Mickey Dolenz was in that movie. It's like, what? <laughs> it's, it's freaking nuts. And, and I will say also, this was quite a downturn given the fact that he had already just been in um, the Phil Kaufman Body Snatchers remake, Escape from Alcatraz, and Eating Raul. So, yeah. sad. Oh, All those illustrious credits and then the same. <laughs> yep. At least he gets to be in uh, Once Bitten later on and Breathless. But, yeah, uh, yeah, and Paul, yeah. Paul Schrader's Breathless, excuse me. Oh, yeah. Which is good. I still haven't seen that all the way through yet, but I've heard it's good. <sighs> yeah, so we get to that. We get to the yeah. cops. I did like the, uh, oh yeah, they're LAPD. They decided to bum rush the, the the bad guys, and my my mother cheered when Laverne saved the day, and then, you know, and the Smith & Jones happens. Yes. That's so stupid. <sighs> this is, like, literally the stupidest thing that this person can do. Literally, who went, look at these two women. Who call themselves Smith and Jones, like as an alias Smith and Jones, the TV show. Look at them and said, "Hey, we're looking for two women named Smith and Jones. They they belong in death row. Who the hell does this? Who does this? Where's the logic? Ah!" <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 sorry. You 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 muppeted there for a second, and I I totally feel you. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> just, just imagine me Kermit flailing. Yeah, it's you um, shackle our bodies, but our spirits are free. Yeah, shackle our bodies, but our spirits will always be free. And then Laverne grabs the gun out of the officer's belt, which um, in another episode that would actually be funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's also a, a gesture that Laverne did make back in Milwaukee. Yes, so that's at least fitting and okay. Everything else is them calling each other Smith and Jones is acceptable. Yeah, that's funny. That's acceptable. That's a good alias. The, the, the cops going, oh, that's our, our our serial killers. That's the people who deserve to die. That's stupid. That gets your state sued. Oh, yeah. Who the hell does that? Mm-hmm. Who the hell does uh... Laverne Shirley, I swear to God, used to be grounded in logic. <sighs> it, I swear to God, first couple of seasons, first few seasons, the majority, even leading into season six and seven, those are logical plot lines. That are based on things that could happen, generally could happen to people. Yeah. Except for Charles Grodin, but forget that. <laughs> Listen, we will remember Charles Grodin in our hearts forever, but we will forget that episode. Always. Forever. But God, this is just a, we hit a all out sustained pitch of nonsensicalness here. Yep. Because... And, and, it's always something somebody would do if they were playing cops and robbers as a child. 
Yeah. Literally. I've never even seen that in a stupid, in a sitcom. Because you have to have some kind of base logic here. Mm-hmm. From somebody saying, hey, you know, uh, this can't happen because uh, we're in reality, not on Mars. It's not like Mork and Mindy where you can do this stuff. It's not like Ren and Stimpy where you can do this stuff. Yeah, Ren and Stimpy. That's different. Yeah. Uh, well, my note there, though. Wild cops not even buying to run fingerprint checks for killing people. How contemporaneous. Oh. oh. Her, her. <laughs> hey, Cab. Uh, Hi-ho. But the... <sighs> And to waste the return of Doris Hess on this. Shame on them. Shame on them. Because uh, for Shame anyone who them. was wondering who the uh, woman uh, guard was, Kluger, that is Doris Hess. That is Sergeant Shannon from In the Army now in season four. Uh, we missed her. Yeah, missed her a bunch. And uh, yeah, she is. Um, I also found out she was in the, th- the epic three-parter of uh, Fonzie Loves Pinky as the character of Tina as well. So that was her first oh. uh, martial arts appearance. That's nice. And That's a good uh, episode. primarily, she's been doing uh, ADR loop group uh, work since uh, the mm-hmm. early 90s. So, fittingly, she even did ADR looping for Father of the Bride, I thought it was very fitting. Aww. And for uh, Night Bear Before Christmas. That's very nice. That's very cool. That's super cool. But what a waste to have this actor, this actor we love, who we adored so much in season four, to come back as this and to not even really get any good lines either her dialogue is actually rather bland like the jokes that even should work are just like pancaked yeah exactly it's bad all of it's bad my note is god this is so dumb <laughs> my next note literally my next note so now we get into part two the nicola rose yeah. segment uh hoot and hoot and then um i'll take the big one uh says uh mama fratelli in the on death oh, row god and Laverne, of course, has to go. She looks just like a woman I used to know on Napstery who used to eat bugs. And uh, uh, do you want to hear about how this scene is worse? Because in the original scene, there was a Lysol joke, a douche-related Lysol joke. There was a what? Yes, there was. Such a creepy goes. There's a phone call from the governor, and everyone goes quiet. And then she says, "It never fails." And she turns to Laverne Sheba and goes, "So how do you like your new neighbors?" And Laverne goes, "I like them just the way they are, behind bars." And then Sheba goes. Aaron told me that it would be overcrowded in here, but I didn't know it would smell so rank. Haven't you ever heard of Lysol? I'm folding my hands and resting my chin on them. <laughs> you're, you're doing the uh, the dad from Evangelion? Yeah. Yeah. That's an actual line of dialogue. Oh, we haven't even got to the part of the script where there's actual racism. That's coming. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, okay, in that case... And the Cougar does say... Sure, it's the most popular drink on the road. Ooh. Uh, yeah, it definitely makes sense that uh, part two was written by the guy who also was responsible for Crime Isn't Pretty. God. Oh, it's so bad. Oh, it's so unfunny. And it's so... It's, the whole the script is already tasteless. Like, God. Anyway. Then the, she actually says, I wish Shirley was here instead of me. I hate that. Wow. I hate that so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, also, they have uh, a, and then they had to throw in a cavity search joke as well. Ah, uh, so bad. And yeah. then they throw her in with uh, Killer, the the Anne Ramsey character uh, that's on yes. death row. It's good to see Mama Fratelli in here. She was fun. Yes. I liked her. And this yeah. joint, I'm the boss. You want to move? You want to yeah. sleep? You want to eat? You check with me. I hate, though, that when she says, I, when Laverne replies, I would kill for a Twinkie, it's sort of, even though the scene fades to black or fades away, fades it actually looks like she's going to get a Twinkie from her bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember if that was actually, you know, always in the, in the script or something, but yeah, yeah. No, it's actually never, never in the script. But yeah, that's actually funny. I wonder if it did get edited for time. Could be. Boy. Anyway, no, hi-ho, good. movie fans, to the time to go to the premiere of the new James Bond film. So we have, you know, Rhonda and Carmine. <laughs> You're so done. Uh... You're so done. There's at least a couple of good uh, good James Bond puns. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least Rhonda's outfit is cute. That's it's another good cute. point about this episode. Yep. Uh, Laverne, Tell Laverne she's fa- got double O seconds to get down here. Oh, Laverne, do me a favor. Don't wear those spiked heels again. Hey. That was good. Um, at this point, by the way, as, as uh, it gets to you know them being completely unaware of what's going on, my mother was just staring blankly at the screen with like, you know, she wasn't. <laughs> head in her hands yet but she was just kind of like what the hell is going on 
she was very. Uh, <sighs> get a Mrs. Fratelli is my next joke. <laughs> what could I do? You snore. My first husband may rest in peace. He used to snore. Uh, Have you looked at the graffiti in the cell? Do you notice any of it? What it says? Oh, the, the writing on the wall? On the cell? Yeah, the graffiti behind them. Uh, guns don't kill people we do. Giving me liberty yeah. or a three-day pass. The butler did yeah. it. And I was framed. The butler did it. That's what I was going to mention. And then come back here, little Sheba. Greenlit that joke. Jesus Christ. Oh, I did note that Sylvia is very Lenny-coded. <laughs> in her patheticness. Which I thought was sweet. Yeah, the Sheba's going to get them killed. I'm sorry. And then trying to squeeze us through the bar. She's not enough of a stick. Yeah. Don't eat anything and we'll try again tomorrow. Uh, I think. Uh, and then Laverne having to go clank, clank, clank with a paper cup. That was cute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wanted to help people and ended up robbing a bank. I just wanted to hang on the beach. Just had a great, yeah, you must have had a great set of values. Uh, uh, my next note is this is painful. <laughs> I'm assuming that has to do with the teaching the Shlemiel Shlemazel dance. Yeah. No, 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 those, that, what came before that was painful. What comes now? Yes. <laughs> my line, my exact quote. Ha 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 fourth wall break. <laughs> funny. Ha 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 Oh, God, it's because it's so bad. It's so fucking bad. I did like the uh, nuclear war joke that uh, Sylvia does. Yeah, that was pretty funny. That was very, really funny. It's very 1982. The audience loved that, by the way. I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then this moment, the uh, it's like her dreaming. Of, so Laverne dreaming of the yeah. future, sitting on the yeah. couch, and a man, him, the man of her life, goes, "Hey," uh, says, "Honey, can I get you a beer?" God, oh my God, she can have that in two seconds with multiple guys. Yeah, Star on canvas. Just reach out and grab it, girl. Come on. Oh my God. So this is where the boys enter. God help us all. This isn't exactly the place you're going to uh, going to meet Mr. Wright or Prince Charming. Oh wow! <laughs> you look. It's, oh look at you, Killer. You look lively today. Oh, it's just a mattress I threw on. <laughs> you only almost missed. Oh god! Uh, uh, I love that Lenny's actually shocked that she's there, and of course we get the kiss. Yes, she makes them kiss by accident. Yeah. And uh, Lenny's. Didn't I tell you she kisses good? Yeah. Uh, so cute. And then everything crashes off oh, the rails. <laughs> they never meddle in family affairs. My lines are bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. Ha ha. My note. Ha ha. The boys still don't think that Frank is going to beat them up for telling them that. Ha 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 ha. It somehow doesn't occur to either of them that if Laverne dies and they have that door on them, Frank is going to murder them. And even the boy's sense of self-preservation, I feel, would be stronger in that direction instead of the other direction. Mm -hmm. At least they did insert Lenny being concerned for Laverne's safety and being upset that she's dead. But, the, but they mainly do not care at all that she is about to die. And in fact, they're coveting her possessions. This is grosser in the script. Where they uh, say that among all their friends, they always thought Laverne was going to be the one that became a serial killer. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, I don't know what they're talking about. Shirley's the one that would go fucking psycho. Yeah. Yeah. Like, let's let's be real here. That woman is, is way too repressed. That is someone that is going to go won't. very much into, like, either Black Widow territory or Billy in a fantasy world, or, or you know what? She might turn into Joe Spinell in Maniac. And yes, oh. I am going to mention Joe Spinell's uh, Joe Spinell in Bill Lustig's Maniac, because yes, it's season fucking eight. Let's go. <laughs> we will, you will wish you were that guy getting murdered by a bunch of women. <laughs> <laughs> you will wish by the time we get there. To me, he's a tornado of a man is a good squiggy line. I will say that. And then mumble something I wouldn't even understand. Yeah. You see, it's this senseless violence that we're trying to avoid, Laverne. I know. I like, I can take it. I'm only a six foot pole. That's funny. Hey, oh, nice one, Lenny. Yeah. Michael's blatantly bleach blonde hair for when they were trying, he's trying to grow it out for Spinal Tap. And they gave up and put a wig on him. It's cute. really obvious. It's very cute. Here. Yep. Anyway, uh, the boy's got a note. My mom was already 
furious at the scene at the episode by this yeah. point by the way she was yeah. yelling it's out of character yeah. look at all the growth that they've just regressed they were getting yeah. better and now like they're worse than ever yeah 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 we all hated that we all hate it we all hate it we all hate it we all hate it uh my all caps notes squiggy you didn't have her put in prison this makes no sense what the fuck is the logic he'll be mad if you didn't say anything his daughter died ah yeah yeah and also uh the carmine and the chunky girl thing God. yeah 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 uh I actually I left the note in here when I gave up taking notes in this episode because oh. of how frustrated I was getting. It's like God, I'll get back to this later. Oh God! Oh God! Why? And then we zoom off to Cowboy Bills, where Scream becomes a subject of violence anyway because this is the Three Stooges for some reason today. You know we are missing a scene here, a scene in which Carmine and Rhonda um, bring Laverne's little black book to Cowboy Bills to try to figure out who she, Laverne is with. That actually would have been super cute. It's huge. Not to mention showed some concern. Oh, no, you will wish you didn't hear. Frank goes, that's a little black book. She hands that one to Frank. She pulls it and says, here, you take A through G. Then she pulls out the one that's the exact same size and then goes, I'll take H to P, then pulls out another one, then goes, Carmine, you start with Q through Z. And Carmine is flipping through it going, G, Q through Z, you think it would be much thinner. And then Rhonda says, she knows a lot of Chinamen. Oh my god! Yeah, this is an actual script excerpt. This really happened. This really freaky happened. Oh, god. Uh, instead of using an actual, like, line, where, they, where Frank lie and reverse the charges, they go, go get a bunch of dimes to go plug them into the, um, into the phone. And bills, and and Lenny and Squiggy, by the way, are trying to pick up girls at this point, as they always do. Man, it's so bad. It's so bad. Yeah, you have flat out blatant racism, is in that script. That thankfully you're not. Yeah, I'm movie. sorry. Yeah, that's why I've gone silent for a second there. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna have to cut around all this because yeah. oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that certainly. Yeah. That doesn't. T that at least makes the bizarro out of nowhere blues brothers moment um yeah i don't know but even yeah, my, yeah, yeah but it, yeah the, the episode goes blues brothers out of blue the disco the disco yeah. sound oh, good band good singers but for what a waste yeah. of an episode oh, god okay how many drugs were involved in the making of this oh, episode yeah, you know what yeah. actually you know what drugs probably would have made this better yeah to be frank yeah yeah if this was done by michael and david toked up to the gills this would be funnier and we both yeah. know it <laughs> we both know it oh we both know it uh... we both know it so the violence happens to squiggy anyway and my nose this is the first time cowboy bill's dinner theater is almost as entertaining as pizza bowl dinner theater almost almost yeah my mother hated that as well she just started groaning even this is silly yeah the notion that the boys don't know right from wrong is painful because yeah they do we've yeah. seen them demonstrably knowing the difference between right and wrong multiple times. Yep, left and wrong is the one they're all sticky about. And to be yeah. fair, I am too, so. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I said it was, oh, honey, 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 it's okay. Okay, no, you don't need to Tina. It's okay. <laughs> it's. <laughs> oh, by the way, oh, I forgot to mention this. Rhonda got flashed by some guys looking for Laverne out of the, uh, uh, the, the Hollywood sign in the script version yeah they flash the light she flashed the lights at them to get them to uh roll down their windows and then she was getting flashed back so let's get back to the episode in question <laughs> let's get the episode itself yeah okay blues yeah. brothers moment we get the priest played by uh let me scroll back up god i had to write so many fucking notes this stupid fucking <laughs> episode ernie <laughs> lee banks as the priest uh, another hey. character actor of his day he also got started an episode hey. of good times in 1974 before popping into black exploitation flicks of the hey. early 70s including baby needs a new pair of shoes and the black godfather and he also returned to tv for a guest spot in the jeffersons in 1975 around this time in the 80s he just come out for part of the, in an episode of the walking tall series he got a lot of different parts across tv and film from the glass shield to the john the rogue show to the x-files to a Polly shore movie passed away in 2006 at the age of 71 and 
honestly, he is definitely one of the highlights of this episode, and I yeah. wish that the poor man had had a better episode to be in. It's like, they really thought this was going to catch on. The thing is that the show's musical numbers before this have all made contextual sense. Yeah, this is fucking yeah. weird. It comes out of freaking nowhere, uh, like we are in the Blues Brothers. It literally feels like we are in the Blues Brothers. And it feels somehow disrespectful because we have these black female prisoners playing back up to Laverne, going to go get fried. And there's something just really off about it, but whenever we had a musical number before, is somebody playing for the talent show, is somebody singing along to a record, is someone performing at the Pizza Bowl Cowboy Bills, or it's someone with a guitar singing and enjoying themselves. Here, where the hell is all this disco backing coming from? Yeah. What the hell is going on? Why is this happening? It's the chronological anthropophagus, man. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, God. My note. Ha 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 ha! Execution gospel number. Ha 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 ha! Also, does anybody else feel that, like, Laverne singing badly is kind of offensive given the backup singers are so much better? Like, I understand it's meant yeah. to be a joke, but it comes off as, like, her grandstanding is, like, it just feels bad. Like, I just, it rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. It made me feel very uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, there's, some, there's a weird racist tilts here i don't even know if i can say that but uh there's something feels off something feels wrong with this one but who cares we get the frank x machina saving the day because he was a former knight of columbus okay. his eyes at columbus and knows the judge and checked in the case and just make a fingerprint check to show yeah. and da 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 then then kluger's gonna go check the <sighs> fingerprints herself your kind God. your kind has to be guilty of something which oof jesus christ Ah. <sighs> uh, Okay, okay, my, my notes for this entire sequence, I had to note, that's not a limousine, that's a hearse. That's mildly funny. Forgive me, Father, but I have not, for I have not sinned. My exact notes during this musical note, musical number. Are we in hell? Ah, yes, heaven, that isn't this place where you can sit. <laughs> then funny in quotation marks. <laughs> uh... Oh, God. The sound of her shutting a black woman up by covering her mouth is, um... um yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, that part I didn't like either. So something again, yeah. it's I I under, I understand this is a touchy word to use optics, but it's just one yeah. of those that, you know, it gives you pause. It gives you yeah. pause, you know? Yeah. Because because yeah. don't get me wrong, there are tons of times when in these certain types of contexts that that's fine or that's funny or I get it based on the context. The context and all the stuff around this just didn't feel right and it can go piss up a fucking rope. <laughs> Uh, I will. I will say. Um, I did laugh at Frank hang, having a Sam Axish buddy down at the town hall, who managed to completely clear this up in two seconds with no judicial gestures, no precedent for anything. Yep. And then the reprise makes me want to shoot somebody. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> well, well, the verse is like hot dog and it out of the prison. Ha ha ha! You're all gonna die. Bye. You're all gonna die. See ya. Uh, my 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 uh my note here is these are 90s mtv jokes not laverta and shirley jokes and bad mtv yeah. jokes at that yep yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah 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 may she rest in peace oh my god so taxing the uh, tag scene. at least the boys are mildly upset but jesus if we eat it Lord. fast it won't go bad before she does ah oh god Okay, why is Carmine carrying Laverne like she it was a toddler that spent too long of a day at the zoo? What happened between the prison and that? That she just collapsed like a plant in the cupboard. Stress. I guess. Otherwise it makes no sense. Even at a restaurant, they give you a box to take her home in. <laughs> that was funny. That was so great. That was funny. Uh, Carmine, you're everything that chunky girl said you were. Another bit of fat shaming, by the way. Fuck that. Fuck this season. God. My last note is funny in quotation marks about the boys' last terrible joke there. And I hate this motherfucking episode. Ha 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 ha. All right. So let's get the last little few notes about cast and crew out of the way, and then we'll we'll call we'll call this good. Um all right. Turbovic, director of this episode, did a decent job, but the tribute for the today for the man today is thus. He was nominated twice. For an Emmy, first in 1980 for the short-lived experimental children's show Hot Hero Sandwich, and then in 1996 for The Puzzle Place. Who'd have thunk? Oh. Writer credits. Robert Perlo and Gene Bronstein, they both return after having gotten credit on The Most Important Day Ever last season, while this being the last one for both parties. 
Both stayed in sitcom writing for the 80s, with Perlow being a story editor on Who's the Boss for a few dozen episodes, where Bronstein also served as a producer. While Bronstein seems to have been retired, has seems to have retired now, Bob Perlow recently uh, returned to TV as a warm-up performer for Ronda Rama's return in the late 2010s. Nick LaRose, the writer of Crime is a Pretty Returns for uh, this strange episode. He has two more to go, including an infamous script and one that features a very cowly co-star. We previously discussed he'd jump onto Brothers for a whopping 33 episodes as a writer and 37 as producer, and would stick to sitcoms for the next 10 years, and seems to also be retired. Actor notes. I don't know why I'm starting to sound like Joe Bob Briggs. I want to mention the cop who's credited here, Francis T. Perry Williams. I do not know which cop this is. It could be the one that's in the station, or the one that's getting ready to bomb rush the robbers. But whatever the case, he's worth noting, because he actually was credited later for the story by on Councilman DeFazio. Tom Newman oh. played the judge, who was another person from Quincy Emmy, again, because that happens a lot this season. Tom Newman had a decade spanning career starting in the late 50s, mostly as police officer parts and things like an episode of Tightrope and one of the cops in Cape Fear. The 70s had him in the usual spots of police story, Mary Tyler Moore and even BJ and the Bear. After this, however, you get to pop into two episodes of Tales of the Dark Side. Uh, sadly, though, he passed away at the age of 60 in 1991, but good run for you, Tom, as the judge. The judge that saves the day. And Ramsey as Keller, Mama Fratelli. Uh, prior notice, we need to make sure we remind folks that, yes, we did mention that she got a teeny tiny blink and missed spot in the Fire Show episode back in season four. Easily one of the most recognizable faces of her era. She's just at the beginning of her winning streak of parts before her unfortunate passing in 1988. At the age of 59. And now that we're all depressed and this episode's depressing, what are we ranking it? This is a one. And it only gets a one because of Lorraine Newman. That is the only thing saving this episode. It melts Laverne's brains down into goo. It denigrates her relationship with almost everybody in the show except for Carmine and uh, Frank and Rhonda. It has an out of nowhere musical number that shouldn't exist. It makes dumb, fourth-wall-breaking references that are not funny. The only thing that could make it worse is including the stuff that got cut out of the script, and which thankfully never made it to air. This is a bad one. It is bad. Yeah, I'm going to give it a two. A lot of the same reasons. I felt Lorraine Newman kept it going enough. Like, I would have to be compelled strongly to watch this again. But I would watch it again. It's not like Bully Show or Racerhead where you'd have to pay me to watch it again. Yeah. And I, from what you've explained, from what I know and what you've hinted at, there are, a, a, there's at least one more of those in this, in this, <laughs> this year coming up. So we're only at about really like, a th true. we're only about like third of the way through. So we're getting there. Yep. All right. Anyway, though, folks, uh, yeah, I guess that's going to be that's going to be it. This is uh, this is one we didn't like very much. But hey, uh, we'll, get, we'll we'll be talking about what's coming up next after a quick word here from our sponsors. And uh, I don't know what I, I just did. Whatever. Just it, it, future me. Roll the clip. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for Night After Nine. And if you would like to know more, you can find us at Night After Nine PC on Twitter or Night After Nine Pod on Facebook, WordPress, Tumblr, Patreon, or YouTube, or wherever good podcasts may be found. And uh, for next time around, uh, you know, it's really weird. I've been having a string of bad luck, Lisa. Uh, did do you think it has anything to do with that chain letter I tossed out? It just might, and that's going to haunt Laverne too. The first decision to ignore Chandler causes bad luck to rain down on her friends and loved ones. In desperation, they call on a fortune teller, but can Laverne ever clear her karma? This is jinxed. <sighs> well, I guess we'll just have to see if it's one that needs to be chucked out a window. Bye, y'all. And when you raid a refrigerator, make sure not to eat the baking soda. Bye. Bye.